Hey guys, welcome back! 11 years before the Metroidvania label was even thought of, there was this title that unknowingly gave birth to that subgenre. Let's explore the universe and development around the sacred armor of Antiriad. Earth 2086, a world on the brink of collapse. Weapons of total destruction were mobilized. Incoming alert! Incoming alert! The retaliation was swift and deadly. The ravaged planet was plunged into a nuclear winter. Centuries passed and from the chaos emerged a new race, strong and resilient. The people came to know a simple and peaceful life. But one day, out of the skies, an invasion forced from another world. The attack was swift and savage. Their weapons were sophisticated and they showed no mercy. Filled with grief at so much death, the people fought back bravely. But bravery was not enough. All remaining able-bodied men were set to work mining the planet's valuable ore, while the tyrants ruled from their stronghold deep inside the volcano. The elders plotted to overthrow the oppressors, and they hid newborn male children and raised them in secret camps, teaching them ancient battle arts. One stood out as a champion. His name, Tal. Tal, you have been chosen as the one who will save our race. You have heard the legends of the sacred armor. Now is the time to bring it back from the dead. You must brave the horrors of the evil forest, find the sacred armor and use it to destroy the power center of the tyrants. You are our only hope. And this is the premise of the sacred armor of Antiriad. As you can see, comics were a source for creativeness from the team behind this title and Dan Malone, the designer responsible for it, that had never touched a home computer before, made this 16-page comic book himself to come bundled with the game. But the very first thing that we think of when looking at its box art is the obvious inspiration on Iron Maiden's logo. Dan Malone had just finished college and computer games were a completely new thing to him. However, an advert from Palace Software asking for an artist with no previous experience with computers caught his eye. He then started working with sprites for Cauldron 2 on the Amstrad and realized that things had advanced quite a bit from the early days of video gaming. Rapidly the ideas for anti riad started to emerge. Then Malone's colleagues pointed out some titles for him to play so that he had an idea of what people were playing and what could be possible to accomplish. So, in the end, and being a huge fan of 2080s style comics, he designed a game with high-tech references on a post-Holocaust world with a mythical theme. In this platform arcade adventure maze type of game set in the year 2086, we control Tal, this Tarzan boy that runs around like the wind, trying to find the anti riad suit that will protect him from the volcano's radiation, destroy the alien citadel and save his people from slavery. But the suit only is useless without the anti-gravity boots that allows him to levitate. Once airborne, the size of this immense maze will unveil itself. 
The atmosphere created by the bundled comic book is enhanced by the graphics, which were among the most eye-catching and detailed to be seen on all 8-bit home computers for which the game was created. Huge sprites were used, with superb smooth animation and even Tal's air waves as he runs, jump and hurl the many rocks knocking out the aliens. After we've located the suit, we can activate it by simply standing in front of it. This will bring to life the control panel on the bottom of the screen, showing important data like, for instance, armor energy levels, the main character's stamina, and the suit's component indicator that tells us how many parts are still missing for us to be able to use it on its full amplitude. All components are of extreme importance. The gravity displacer aforementioned as anti-gravity boots, the pulsar beam, laser fire to blast the alien droids, the particle negator, a force field to protect the suit from radiation, and the implosion mine that we'll be using to destroy the generator room. Once with all the components it's time to head down to the aliens base, plant the implosion mine and blow them back to outer space. In October of 1986, Palace Software released this game. 60 days earlier, in August, Metroid was made available in Japan for the Famicom Disk System. In September, and also for the Famicom Disk System, Akumaju Dracula, also known as Castlevania, was as well released in Japan. Despite the similarities of gameplay between these games, at that time it was impossible to the developers of these particular games know about each other. So, it was a complete coincidence. The NES PAL versions of Metroid and Castlevania only arrived in UK a lot later, in January and in December of 88 respectively. So, this side-scrolling game, which features staggered open-world progression dependent on item acquisition, was unknowingly the very first Metroidvania type of game. anti Riad was also distributed a year later in the US by Apex and over the name Red Warrior, available for the Commodore 64 and 128, Apple II and MS-DOS. In 1988, the game was also converted to the TRS-80 color computer. Graphically stunning, brilliantly programmed and nearly faultless, the Sacred Armor of anti riad offers considerable scope for exploration being a must for all mapping freaks and the very start of a subgenre that should have been labeled as anti rioidvania Sadly, on the ZX Spectrum side, there's no 128K version of this game. The presence of a tune on the background while playing would have added a bit more drama and suspense to this already staggering game. However, the title music composed by Richard Joseph is, on the Commodore 64, one of the best tunes ever made for that system. So guys, here you have it. The very first Metroidvania title that its creators developed without any knowledge that games like Metroid and Castlevania were about to be released, cause back then there was no Google to translate Japanese video game news on the fly. For them, at Palace Software, those two Famicom exclusive titles didn't exist. And when you have designers with similar influences from science fiction and comic books, the result can be, as seen, comparable. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Pixel Thing, Share, subscribe, like and watch my latest videos that I bring every week to the best fans of retro gaming around the world. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next week.